So my passage is Romans 8, 12 to 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Last week when Reverend Horner began reading his message, I realized I might have a little, little problem. You see, our readings were both from Romans 8. In fact, they overlapped. I started about two verses before him and he went on a little farther. You ever felt really, really nervous? <laughs> Where's he going? Oh, so while I'm trying to see where he's going and whether I'm going to be rewriting my entire sermon less than a week before I'm going to deliver it, he talked about Hezekiah 5.12. For those of you who weren't here, he was talking about a group of theology students. Whenever they wanted to make a point, they would simply state their point and then say, Hezekiah 5.12 or Hezekiah 3.16. This sounds very, very impressive until you pull out your Old Testament and try and find Hezekiah. Doesn't exist. It was a king of Israel. So I bring that up because how many things can you get up? Did I just cut out? I cut out. Now I'm back again. <laughs> how many things can you get out of a passage? If it doesn't exist, you can get an infinite number of things out of it because you're making it up as you go. When you're starting with an actual passage in the Bible, you can only go in as many directions as there are that are true to the text. Fortunately, well, Reverend Dave last week had chosen to go one direction. I had gone another direction with the passage. I was rather relieved. <laughs> So he focused on being a prisoner of hope. I focused on what this passage says about who we are. Reverend Horner talked about things that imprison us, including literal prisons, taxes, and inflation. As Paul says, we are debtors. It is the language of counting. Before Jesus came, certain actions required a sacrifice. They were measured. Today, we're also measured, from grades in school, to performance assessments at our jobs, to credit scores. Our lives are governed and shaped by these various numbers. In China, they're even developing a social credit score that will attempt not just to capture whether people pay their bills on time, but their wider impact on society. The score, likewise, will have a much wider impact on their lives. Sometimes I wonder if we don't have that same impression of God, and that he views us through some sort of divine point system. I certainly did when I was younger anyway. Start fight with neighbor, 10 point penalty. Help little old lady cross the road, five point bonus. So those of you who had kids or had younger friends a few years ago, you probably remember Pokemon Go. It, Gave you played on your phone, and you would go hunting down these virtual creatures around town. One church in the town I was in actually planted some of these in their congregation. So people would show up at church and get 200 points for being in the sanctuary. Today, it's easy to assume there's a score that defines our relationship with God. Does God view us as a kind of game score? Is that who we are? 
Before Paul can address them in this passage, he has to acknowledge there are consequences for our actions. If we choose what our old selfish man wants, what it desires, the consequences, the passage says, are that we will die. Some people assume when they see this kind of phrase that it's talking about our eternal salvation. The word in Greek isn't about a distant future, but something more immediate. Our actions kill us. For instance, I used to smoke. But no matter what I thought I got out of smoking, every time I decided to smoke another cigarette, it was damaging my lungs and slowly poisoning my body. Paul's old man calls us to action that damage, actions that damage our body, cut us off from each other, and turn our lives into one of just existing. In those moments, we can give in to what the old self wants, or we can rely on God to choose life. This passage in Romans is full of assurances, guarantees that we have the power to say no to death and yes to life. One of those assurances is that we can use the power of the Holy Spirit to kill the actions of the old self. Paul covers the how in other passages. For instance, in 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8, for God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, similar to the phrasing in Romans, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. As we use the Spirit's power to live, love, and practice self-discipline, we become less and less like that old self and more and more like Christ. When I finally decided to quit smoking and prayed about it and actually meant it this time, the cravings to smoke actually dropped off, but they were still there. The urge to go outside and smoke, the urge of the old man, as Paul calls him, to enjoy. But with self-discipline, I was able to make the choice not to go to the store and get another pack of cigarettes. You see, you aren't a person earning a game score. You have power, love, and self-discipline. I didn't quit smoking alone. I got my wife's help. Our passage isn't just about individuals. It's addressed to a group, brothers and sisters. Every you, Y-O-U, in this passage is plural in the Greek. I am not meant to do this alone. Rocky is not meant to do this alone. Tim is not meant to do this alone. Milo is not meant to do this alone. Claudia is not meant to do this alone. None of us are meant to do this alone. The power of we is another assurance that's hidden in this passage. James 5 16 teaches, to get some specifics on it, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. We are to seek each other's help, learn from each other, pray. For each other and encourage each other. Even the legendary Paul had people on him, with him, sorry, had people with him on his missionary journals, journeys and even when he was in prison. Saying whether, whenever two or more are gathered in my name isn't just about Christ being present, it's about us the body of Christ being real, present, and effective. You are not a game score. You're not even playing by yourself. You have us. We are to be there for each other. We are the body of Christ. One of the reasons the Bible calls God Heavenly Father is that we base our image of God on our parents. But that image is tarnished by what the Bible calls sin. Even the best parents are still human after all. They still make mistakes. And thus we have TV shows where you see characters like Homer Simpson 
you read fairy tales with evil stepmothers, and new releases of movies, the new Star Wars is out. Darth Vader, Star Wars series was based on part of the guy's relationship with his father, or what he saw it as. There are plenty of people whose parents are, at least in their minds, deeply flawed, and that image gets in the way of God, or gets in our way between us and God. So it's not surprising that when Paul says we receive a spirit of adoption, he's careful to make sure that we know what kind of a parent God is. By saying that we are children and heirs, he was reminding his audience of Roman law. Under Roman law, the process of adoption was much deeper than what we experience in this country, or what we have in this country. It wasn't just about family taking on basic responsibilities for feeding and housing the child. The adopted child became entitled to the status, the property, the burdens, and the rights of their new parents. We're far more than ugly step stepchildren. We are joint heirs with Christ. When we turn to God, we are the prodigal son returning home. The father saw him coming, and while the son was still out there walking home, the father ran out to him. In that moment, the prodigal son, someone who'd become profoundly lost, was saved from his own actions because his father was unbelievably forgiving and overflowing with grace. But the father didn't stop there. He put a robe of office on him and a ring of authority on his finger. The prodigal son had back all the same status as the son who had never left. You aren't a person earning a game score. You are children of God. You are princes and princesses in the kingdom of heaven. Paul didn't stop there. He keeps building. He goes farther than Roman law and the prodigal son. He says we can cry, Abba, Father. Abba means father and daddy in Aramaic. He's saying the same word twice, father, father. A lot of scholars argue about this, but I've got a really simple theory. Jesus didn't speak Greek like the rest of the New Testament. He spoke a different language called Aramaic. Abba is Aramaic, and Jesus had used it before. He used it in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, please take the cup away from me. When he cries, Abba, Father, what he's saying is at our deepest, most pained moments, at our greatest moments of joy, when we don't need somebody in charge, we don't need an authority figure, we need someone who loves us as we are and understands us and will listen. That that's who God will be for us. That we can cry, Abba, Father. It's like crawling, a kid crawling in their father's lap. It's an amazing, amazing image that we can do that. Us big, manly men, well, I'm not a big manly man, so I mean, that we can do this. We can, with God, if nobody else, we can let our guard down and go to God with whatever we want and he will listen. You aren't a person earning a game score. You're somebody who can cry, Abba, Father. When I began the sermon, I asked, does God give us a game score? All these things, game scores, credit scores, the old sacrificial system Jesus did away with are about keeping score. Something we think of as determining winners and losers. God doesn't see us as a game score. He doesn't use us winners or losers in the game life. When you turn to him, he ran down the path to you. He put that robe and ring on you and he changed who you are. And he changed who I was. And he changed who you were. We are not who we were. Who we are now is children of God. Who we are now is fully adopted into God's family. 
who we are is a people with the power to defeat our dying past. Live lives that overflow with life and do so in a way that glorifies Christ and God. And that will be honored in the world to come. We, who we are is we, the body of Christ. Who we are is people who call out, Abba, Father. God does not see us as a score. He sees us as who we are. And he wants us to see ourselves as he does, as who we are now. He doesn't want you to turn back. He wants you to know who you are and follow the Spirit forward. Who we are is the body of Christ that will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Don't turn back. Don't reduce your life to a score. Don't go back to being afraid of losing the game of life. Choose to be who you are and follow the Spirit forward. 